for the very kind introduction and thank you to the entire selection committee and the IMP and the Burson Foundation for this extremely exciting and honored opportunity to be here and present my work. As was mentioned, this is my PhD work from Olivia Porquier's lab over at Harvard Med School. So what I will be discussing today is actually a question that is, to me, the most fundamental question in the world. <laughs> so it's actually about how different embryos of different species can undergo the same sequence of developmental events, which uh, are very highly conserved, especially within mammals, but they can do so at remarkably different speeds. So here I'm showing a human and mouse embryonic development uh, and here are the timelines in absolute number of days that the same kinds of early developmental events uh, are happening in the different timelines. So if we look at this, the actual scaling as a mouse goes through the stages of implantation, gastrulation, all the way through organogenesis, the mouse, for example, starts implantation day four after fertilization, but human does so day eight after fertilization. And the same kind of uh, scaling will happen for every kind of developmental event during embryogenesis, such that generally speaking, we can say that human embryos develop two to three times slower than mouse embryos, even though the steps that are actually happening are quite conserved. And at these early stages, the embryos are actually still of similar size. So the question for me is, how is this regulated? How is it possible uh, to sort of fine tune just the timing without changing the relative sequence of events? So we know that at the bottom of this sort of hierarchical regulation pyramid, there exists individual clock and timer mechanisms that will uh, time specific developmental events. And my PhD advisor spent quite a lot of time describing one of these clocks, the segmentation clock. And what we need to think is what could there be that works upstream of these clocks and timers to scale all of them simultaneously to either accelerate or slow down by like shrinking or expanding the timeline. And what is thought in the field is that what is responsible for scaling these clocks and timers is actually differences in something as basic as the kinetics of gene expression and also protein degradation. So work from other labs has shown that the cumulative time that it takes from the start of transcription to actually observing functional protein is about twice as long in human cells as in mouse cells. And once that protein is made, the half-life is more than twice as long for human cells than for mouse cells. And here I'm speaking genome-wide eh, for all the proteome, for all the transcriptome. So these are very general differences that we can uh, pretty straightforwardly think how just like faster gene expression, faster protein degradation could accelerate eh, these clocks and timers. But then obviously the next question is, well, what gives rise to differences in gene expression kinetics between species? And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. This was the focus of my work. It is a hypothesis-based approach that we took. We started thinking about what else we know about differences between species, and a very well-described relationship between body mass and metabolic rate is known as Kleiber's law. And what this relationship describes is that the smaller animals, here I'm talking about adult body mass, uh, tend to have a higher mass-specific metabolic rate. And now what is also interesting is that, generally speaking, these smaller animals that have the accelerated metabolic rate often tend to be the ones that during development are going through embryogenesis faster. Our hypothesis was that perhaps metabolism could regulate developmental rate by determining the gene, the speed of those gene expression steps um, I was describing before. And to tackle this question, we actually used a model of one of the developmental clocks, the segmentation clock, that I developed during the earlier part of my PhD, and which I will briefly describe now. The segmentation clock is one of the best described embryonic timing mechanisms. It is a molecular oscillator that controls the rhythm of somite formation in all vertebrate embryos. So somites are uh, the precursors of the vertebral column and the associated muscles. And you can see them here as, a, this is a schematic of a chicken embryo shown to the, next to the picture of an actual chicken embryo. 
uh, about two days old chicken embryo. And you can see the somites here. Uh, these are these uh, blobs of mesoderm that are bilaterally symmetric, and they are formed from the unsegmented pre somitic mesoderm called, I will abbreviate as PSM for the rest of the talk. And the, the, what the clock is doing is it's active here in the pre somitic mesoderm as an oscillator. And each time the oscillator completes one cycle, it triggers the formation of a new somite pair. So in this uh, animation here, the blue clock signal provides this periodic signal to cause the formation of a new somite pair. And even though this is just one clock among many in embryos, it is a very good proxy for overall developmental rate because it scales among different species with the overall time of embryogenesis. So here I'm showing different species, mouse, rabbit, cow, human, uh, marmoset, and how long it takes for them to complete embryogenesis. And over here is their segmentation clock period. So it scales quite linearly, actually. So it's a very good proxy for developmental rate in general. Now, of course, uh, I am not in the business of keeping a, a menagerie of animal models in the lab. It's impossible. <laughs> um, so we took an approach to try to recapitulate this clock in vitro from stem cells. So we, the goal was to create presomitic mesoderm completely in vitro in 2D culture and try to observe the segmentation clock there. So uh, we can start with either mouse or human prepotent stem cells. And we provide just two factors to create the presomitic mesoderm fate. Those factors are wind activation to specify mesoderm and BMP inhibition to make sure that that mesoderm is of the presomitic kind, so paraxial mesoderm. And we can obtain the right cell type uh, with a decent induction efficiency in a quite a quick time. Now, the, the goal is to see if those, these presomitic mesoderm cells that we make can undergo oscillations of the segmentation clock. And this here is a movie over one day of imaging human cells. And what I am showing is a transcriptional reporter for a segmentation clock gene has seven. I hope you can observe that it's not a flat dynamic. The intensity goes up and down. And if we were to track it in a small region over here, what it would show would be that it just goes up and down and up and down over time. And those are the oscillations of the segmentation clock in a minimal 2D system. Now, what is important is that if we look at these oscillations, they have a different period if you start with mouse cells or with human cells. So you can clearly see that in the same amount of time, the mouse cells undergo more oscillation. So their oscillation period is close to two and a half hours, whereas the human period is about five hours. So with this clock, we can recapitulate completely in vitro and with high precision the two-fold difference in developmental rate that I was alluding to in the beginning between mouse and human embryos. So we wanted to use this system to ask that question about whether metabolism is regulating developmental rate. So for that, we need to, to check whether metabolic rates scale with the segmentation clock period in our prismatic cells in vitro. We characterize in many ways the metabolism of these cells, but I'll show you just one example for the sake of time. So these here are seahorse assays. We measured oxygen consumption rate as a measure of respiration, mitochondrial respiration, and also glycolytic platinum efflux rate as a measure of glycolysis. And I hope you can appreciate that the rates for this metabolic activity is higher in mouse cells than in human cells in both cases. And moreover, if we use a very simple dye to stain mitochondria in these cells uh, and quantify their mitochondrial content, mouse cells also have about twice as much mitochondrial content per cell as human cells. So there is indeed this scaling relationship between mouse and human. That is just a correlation. We need to test if it's functional. So we need to check whether the differences in metabolic rate between species are functionally relevant to developmental rate. And for that, we focused on the electron transport chain and applied different small molecule inhibitors to different parts of the electron transport chain at very low doses that are sublethal, just to partially impair the electron transport chain and check what the effect is on the segmentation clock period. So I will show inhibitors for the different complexes here that uh, transfer electrons and also pump protons to build up the gradient here in the inner membrane space. 
and also for the ATP synthase itself, which uses that gradient to create ATP. So here I'm showing human cells as a control. The uh, period is about five hours, as I showed before. If we block complex one, partially, of the electron transport chain, the period becomes longer, so the oscillations are slower. This is uh, also true, but more markedly, if we block complex three, and even more if we block complex four. So blocking this part here has a very significant effect of slowing down the clock. But surprisingly, if we block the ATP synthase itself, which naively as a developmental biologist, I thought this is the output of the electron transport chain. This is what it's supposed to be doing. That does not affect the clock at all. And if we apply an ionophore that breaks down, collapses this proton gradient so that it cannot be used for ATP synthesis, that um, also has no effect on the clock period. So it suggests that indeed there is a, a role for metabolism in functionally regulating the pace of the segmentation clock, but it is not through ATP production. It is actually some of the activity happening by the chain per se. The chain has many, many functions, so to cut the story short, it turned out to be the function right here, which is to regenerate NAD from an ADH to maintain redox balance in the cell. So when we apply these inhibitors, um, as I was just showing, what ends up happening is because you cannot regenerate NAD, you accumulate NADH, and that can be seen here in the NAD and ADH ratio. So you have, uh, with each inhibitor applied, kind of like a progressive uh, reduction of the ratio, so progressive accumulation of NADH, and this might be uh, the defect that is causing the segmentation clock to be slower. And to test whether that was the case, we actually used a little bit of a trick. So you can use the reaction catalyzed by lactate dehydrogenase, which uh, interconverts lactate and pyruvate. And this is an equilibrium reaction, so you, you put a lot of one reagent in the system, you will push the reaction in the opposite direction. So we can feed the cells with a lot, a lot of pyruvate to push it this way and have like a completely separate mechanism of regenerating NAD, even when the chain is blocked. So what happens then is that here I'm showing the NAD and ADH ratio in the A-side treated cells, that is a complex four inhibitor that gave us the most significant effect on the segmentation clock period. As expected, the ratio is way down. But if we supplement with pyruvate to push the reaction this way and make an AD, then uh, we can partially recover the ratio. And very interestingly, if we now look at what happens to the clock period in this case, the ASI treatment ma makes it way longer, approximately two hours longer each cycle, but we can partially rescue that with pyruvate, uh, presumably because of this correction that is happening. Now, to really be sure that the NAD and ADH ratio is what is playing the, the role here, we went ahead and tried, again, a function approach as opposed to the loss of function that I've just shown you. And we took advantage of this uh, enzyme here, lb nox which was first described in, by Bamsi Musa's lab. And what this reaction, this enzyme does, it catalyzes this reaction where it takes NADH, photons, and oxygen, and it, it regenerates NAD and water. So this is a remarkable little enzyme that does the entire electron transport chain reaction, like all of those huge complexes, everything in, with just one enzyme. So it's absolutely amazing. For us, the important part is that it um, can, when overexpressed, uh, lead to the slight increase of the NAD and ADH ratio uh, in otherwise unperturbed human cells. And if we then check uh, the segmentation clock period, we can see that there is also a slight acceleration going on. So we are quite excited by this result, even though it's modest, because the segmentation clock has not been accelerated before in a, by such a treatment. So we think it's really the case that what is going on is that uh, the redox balance is what is key here. Now, I will go back to the original hypothesis and uh, show you that I only kind of partially answered this question. I said my hypothesis is metabolism regulates developmental rate. So maybe that I've hopefully convinced you that that is at least partially true. Uh, but I said that it does so by determining the speed of gene expression steps. So what about that? Is that actually going on? And uh, to, to check on that, we 
need to know if the species-specific metabolic rates give rise to differences in gene expression kinetics. I will mainly talk only now about translation rate in the interest of time, but we did check uh, other steps of gene expression. So we first assessed translation rate in mouse and human cells using this assay here. So we can pulse the cells for one hour with pure mycin. This is an amino acid analog that will become incorporated into nascent peptide chains and they will be terminated. So we will have this accumulation of pure mycelated peptides, which we can then detect with an anti-pure mycin antibody. And the accumulation of these peptides over the course of an hour is a proxy for translation rate. So you can see here, there is indeed a difference between mouse and human in the basal translation rate. This is of course a global rate. So um, mouse cells undergo translation faster. And importantly, the functional test again, if we treat uh, here our human cells treated with a very low dose of the translation elongation inhibitor cyclohexamide, you can indeed slow down slightly at least the segmentation clock period. So those gene expression kinetics, as was previously suggested, do play a role in regulating the pace of the segmentation clock. But we wanted to know if the electron transport chain inhibitors are working through that. And so I'll show you here again those inhibitors uh, of the electron transport chain complexes that were um, causing the segmentation clock to be progressively and progressively slower. And indeed, we see that those treatments lead to progressive um, decrease in the rate of translation as shown by pure mice incorporation. And it even comes back up a little bit in my pyruvate rescue experiment that I was talking about before. Um, and uh, just to, to be sure, we check translation in the case of the gain of function experiment, that LB Knox experiment where we increase the NAD and ADH ratio to accelerate the segmentation clock. In that case also, uh, the pure mycin incorporation rate is slightly increased. So if we take all of this together, what I've presented to you today is that uh, we think we have filled out at least a little bit more of this um, regulatory cascade. So as I said in the beginning, there are these clocks and timers down here, which seem to be regulated by gene expression kinetics, but I only spoke today about translation rate, which in turn seem to be regulated by the NAD and ADH redox balance, which in turn are set up by the rate of the electron transport chain. And we still have plenty of work to do because there might be parallel mechanisms. And ultimately, we also need to find what are the genome sequence difference between species that are responsible for this. So that is the end of my talk. I'd like to acknowledge, uh, again, obviously, the Bristol Foundation and the IMP uh, for having me here today, but also my wonderful advisor, Olivia Poquia, for the nomination and for his uh, mentorship, and everyone in my lab, my collaborators, and the funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.